Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. My name is Jill Foos. I'm a functional medicine and integrative nutrition health coach. I created this podcast to bring you along as we travel down intriguing science-packed roads, debunking old medical paradigms and perusing new innovative therapies and modalities with the finest functional medicine doctors, practitioners, and like-minded biohackers while living our best life. Enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode on the Health Trip Podcast. Whether you're re-entering the dating pool after a hiatus or continuing your journey in the world of romance, this episode is tailored just for you, midlife women who are navigating the unique blend of personal transformation and relationship dynamics that menopause bring. Today, we are going to unravel the complexities and embrace the exciting opportunities of dating during this empowering stage of life. Menopause often marked by significant physical and emotional changes such as hot flashes, vaginal dryness, low libido, weight gain, and even hair loss also heralds a period of profound personal growth and self-awareness. It's a time when many women experience a renewed sense of freedom and confidence, incredibly attractive qualities in the dating world. We'll explore how to harness your life experiences to enrich your romantic adventures, discuss strategies to communicate your needs and desires effectively, and tackle the challenges of intimacy and vulnerability that often accompany new relationships at this stage. We'll also cover practical tips for dating platforms, ensuring safety online, and finding potential partners who share your zest for life. I'm excited to introduce my guest to you today. Her name is Bella Gandhi. She is a dating relationship expert, TEDx speaker, and founder of Smart Dating Academy, and has been featured on most national and local media outlets, including Good Morning America, The Steve Harvey Show, The Today Show, The Kelly Clarkson Show, Access, ABC, NBC, Fox, and more. After she graduated with dual degrees in finance and German from the University of Illinois, Bella worked in mergers and acquisitions for Arthur Anderson in Chicago for a year before joining her family's chemical manufacturing company, where she divided her time between Chicago and Europe, helping to expand the business. Her family went on to sell the company, and Bella had a strong feeling that her career would one day be taking a sharp turn in a very different direction. She discovered her love of matchmaking and providing dating advice. It is then that she launched the Smart Dating Academy in 2009. Smart Dating Academy has quickly become one of the nation's top date coaching firms and teaches busy, successful professionals to jumpstart their dating lives successfully. Smart Dating Academy is described by its clients like going to Harvard Business School, but for dating and relationships. Smart Dating Academy coaches become personal trainers for their clients' love lives, helping them to navigate the ever-changing world of online and in-person dating. And their coaching program is result-oriented and fun, which helps you clarify who is right for you, stop old dating patterns, and how to use technology the right way. Clients become positive and enthusiastic about dating and relationships again and find love in a really difficult time in their life, which is the transitioning of the menopause journey. Medical disclaimer before we dive in. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice or to make any lifestyle changes to treat any medical condition in yourself or others. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. And this entire disclaimer also applies to any of my guests on my podcast. So sit back, open your mind, and let's dive deep into the world of dating and menopause. Hi, Bella. Hi, the Health Trip Podcast. I am so excited to be here, Jill. It's just so good to see you and hear you again. Yeah, we met a long time ago when I was going through my own separation and divorce. And um, we met at Fox Studio and we were both doing back-to-back segments. And I had no idea about the dating world. So I'm really looking forward to diving into this podcast with you. We're here to talk about midlife women, menopause, and dating. Uh, I mean, you're the expert here, right? You've got the Smart Dating Academy. What are you seeing on your end? 
Wow. I mean, I think as you well know, dating in midlife, when you kind of have, you know, you're going through your 2.0, who am I now in this next and best chapter of my life? I think it can be the greatest time and it can be the greatest love that we've ever had. And I love how much focus is finally coming on to, you know, singles in midlife over 40, 50, whatever the number is, you know, as seen by the golden matchmaker, right? And now they're going to have the goal or the golden bachelor, and then we're going to have the golden bachelorette, right? And so everybody is talking about menopause and golden, and I'm here for all of it. And this can be the best time ever to date. And I love that you say this is the best time of our lives or potentially could be because menopause brings to the table a lot of challenges, a lot of physiological and emotional challenges. I mean, women are often gaining weight. They're experiencing hair thinning, hair loss. Um, their skin doesn't look the same. They're feeling more anxious. Sleep is troublesome. Exercise is a challenge. Like there's a lot of challenges going on. Ooh, and so did you, lot. yeah, when you started the Smart Dating Academy, did you even think about these things? No, of course not. Right. Right. I mean, you know, I started this business when I was in my thirties, right? I had a one-year-old and a five-year-old and I had sold a business and this was my true purpose and my true passion. Cause I had put so many people together that, but no, I didn't think about what it was like to be dating when you were in menopause or just dating at any particular age. I just knew I can help everybody. And I just was, you know, steamrolling fast forward and into it. Yeah. So what do, what continues to shock you, if any conversations do, when you're speaking to your clients who are in perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, in terms of um, how they're going to start on this journey of dating? It surprises me that people don't know how much help exists for them out there, right? That if your doctor isn't giving you good answers, get another doctor. If you get another doctor and if that doesn't work, find someone like you, find an expert that can help you because there is always somebody that can help you to get better, feel better, or to be better. Yeah. I really like that because it is going to start with how the woman feels about herself. Um, I would imagine that most women, by the time they get to you, they're feeling a little bit better about themselves because I guess if they weren't, they wouldn't even be looking to enter into the dating world. But these are some really big um, challenges, but women also come to the table with a lot of strengths in terms of this postmenopausal phase of their life. What are some of those bigger strengths that you're seeing? It's the advantage that comes along with age and wisdom, right? You know who you are. You have been around the block a few times. You know, maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you've been widowed prematurely. Maybe you've had lots of relationships that didn't lead to marriage. It doesn't matter, but you have data, right? You know yourself, you know what works for you and you know what doesn't work for you. And the other beautiful part about this phase is that we're looking for companionship, for romance, for friendship, and for intimacy. The thought of having to get married, no one has to get married, right? The thought of having kids is really, you know, the ship has kind of sailed for most people. So we're really sometimes for the first time, Jill, dating for ourselves and what makes yeah. me happy. Yeah, Not who I do I that. procreate with, to have kids with, and, you know, what's their income level and what's mine and where are we going to live? And yeah, da, da, da. this is just like, I just want to have the lid to my pot. I don't need one. Yeah. Let's talk about that sexual intimacy part, because that could be um, a real challenge for women to going through this time. You know, sometimes there's uh, oftentimes there's vaginal dryness, um, body image issues. What can you do from your perspective to help facilitate the conversation around intimacy and what that might look like? Like, should the woman talk about this with their potentially new partner? You know, here are some of the challenges I'm going through right now. Um, do you coach on any of that? Yeah, 100%. One of the most important things in a very strong relationship is the ability to talk about anything. 
And you have to be able to talk about like that hurts or whatever is happening in your body. And you might be in a relationship for a long time and your body's changing and what used to feel good now sexually doesn't feel good. So you have to be able to use your voice and you have to be able to talk about it with the other person. And sometimes, and I've seen relationships where let's say a woman will be vulnerable and just say, listen, you know, my body has changed and I'm dry or whatever it is, or this hurts. And her partner is so receptive to it because then they know it's not a me problem. It's not a yeah. problem. This is something that we, I can help you with this. That's all I want to do because that's what true love really is. It's wanting the other person to enjoy the experience, wanting the other person to feel good about it and feel good about themselves. Yeah. And like you said, there's so many resources out there these days to help women come up with what to say, how to say it, just to sort of wrap their head around that conversation, because you haven't known this person for long at all. And you really do have to be um, uh, an advocate for yourself in this type of situation. I know for me, I was going through perimenopause at the time of meeting you and having some of these physiological changes myself. And, you know, I thought about it, you know, what am I going to say? How is this going to be? One thing I will say though, and maybe you've um, observed this with your clients is when you are meeting someone new and when you finally find that sense of freedom and you've sort of locked in on what the new value systems are for you in terms of finding that potential partner, there's a whole level of excitement there that you might not even have the physiological challenges present in that moment because you're just so excited. Right. I mean, exactly. You know, God or the universe wants humans to procreate, right? So yeah. sometimes when you are meeting a new person, it's exactly right. The excitement and the hormones that surge in you when you're first like obsessed with somebody, falling in love with somebody, you'd be surprised at how well things can start to work again. Yeah, absolutely. I have clients Was in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. They're having great sex, the best sex of their lives. Oh, I love that. I plan on being one of those people. Great. For sure. I, um, I read this study and I sent it to you before we were meeting. And this, I thought this was really interesting. It says that um, seven in 10 women, so 73% of the women that responded to this study blamed menopause for the breakdown of their marriage. That's, that's pretty, that is significant. Do you hear that when you're first meeting with your clients? Are they aware that that might be something that started the breakdown of their marriage? You know, to be honest, I haven't heard it cited as the major reason. I think it's an and, you know, and we had been arguing for years beforehand, right? And he was traveling all the time. And then I hit menopause. And so it's sort of thrown in there especially for women, you know, 45 to 60 years old. So I haven't heard it as cited as the primary reason, but it certainly doesn't help anything. Yeah. No, I thought it was a really interesting stat. All right. So when a midlife woman is ready to start dating again, what are the best ways to start this process? Besides, of course, meeting you, right? But in um, and, and going through your academy, which I want you to talk about as well, but what, how are women now supposed to sort of plan for this new phase in their life? Do they just go online? Do they hire a matchmaker? You know, where do they start? I think, I mean, I am a firm believer and so passionate about what we do at Smart Dating Academy, which is really level setting the playing field. You know, so many of our clients come out of toxic relationships that were toxic at the time, right? Or they haven't dated in 20 years because their spouse has passed and they're like, oh my God, I haven't been on a date since 1992. I don't even know how to do this. I think for me, whenever I want to do something new, I hire an expert. I'm not going to think that I'm going to go out there and do this on my own because I know why stumble and fall if I can invest in myself and invest in someone who's going to be like, this is the right path forward. I do that. So if that resonates with you, then 
hire somebody that can help you with this. You don't have to do this alone. 30 years ago, you had to do it alone. But now with online dating and the proliferation of ways to meet people, and as divorce continues to happen, I think it's really smart to have somebody make sure that you don't repeat the same red flag things that you might have accepted in your prior life. How do you sell online dating to a woman who's just coming out of a 25 or 30 year marriage who hasn't been in the dating scene? You know, it's online dating. It's the world's largest cocktail party. And that's mm. the party that you want to be at. Is it easy? No. Is it easy to be at the world's largest cocktail party where you don't know anybody? No, but you certainly don't want to miss that. And that's the best metaphor for online dating is if you're out there dating, you come to see pretty quickly that it's possible to meet people in real life, but it's fewer and far between, far, further between than it was when we were in school. So it just gets harder. It's a robust okay. pipeline. Talk about some of those exercises you um, do with the women, your clients, to help them wrap their head around what it is they're actually even looking for in a partner. Yeah, you know, it's a good question, Jill. One of the things when clients first come on board with us, it's really important to me that we thoroughly understand them and the journey that they've walked. So we have a dossier of questionnaires, which I don't know if you remember, but people- I do. Yeah, you fill them out and it's very much, and we go deep, like tell us about your family of origin. What was your parents' marriage like? What do, were they like with you? If they're still alive, how is it now? What impact did that have on you? Detailing all of your prior relationships. What drew you to this person? What worked? What didn't work? What was their responsibility? What was yours? And getting this constellation of data points so that when we first meet you for the first time, we have a really good idea of what is going to work for you and what red flags you might be willing to accept because that's what you were comfortable with in your marriage. Mm. And so some of the exercises that we do, we teach people about how to pace, how to build a dating funnel. What is a dating funnel? It's having multiple options. It's like when you're a college kid, you're going to interview for as many jobs as you can, because the more options you have, the more powerful you are and the better job you'll be able to accept. Dating is so much the same way. It's like having a million dollars to invest. You're not going to take the million dollars and put it all in one place. You're going to diversify your risks. So you've got a good, safe portfolio. Dating is very much the same way. So creating a dating funnel is super important and really figuring out, I think one of the best exercises we do, in fact, I gave a TED talk about it a few years ago, is how do you actually operate from the right checklist? And we have a very transformative exercise that helps our clients transform their checklist. And if you're listening to this going, what is this? I promise you, when you walk in, the checklist you have will be dramatically different by the time that we're done with you, right? Because we're thinking about love and relationships in a very different way. I love that. I probably, you know, it's been a long time since I worked with you, um, but I did go through this process for everyone listening and it was wonderful and it was exactly what I needed for myself. And I could only imagine my checklist was not at all what my checklist was walking out of my sessions, right? And being done with that process. Um, so just going through these exercises alone really helped boost my confidence and gave me hope. And I think hope is like such a great thing for women in midlife, because again, we're faced with these physiological changes. Sometimes we just don't feel good. It takes a lot of work to feel better. Um, things are not getting easier. Sometimes they get harder. Yeah. And just really understanding your value system and prioritizing and being hopeful and just staying the course and also being patient. I think patience is a really big one that plays in, in, in this journey. What are your thoughts on that? Patience is everything. You're right. Yeah. It's, you know, I always say you have to be the three P's patient, perseverant, and positive through the mm. process. And hope is the first step in anything you have to, and divorce sucks. Being a widow when you 
you know, prematurely or at any time, it right. just sucks, you know, wishing you had love and you're feeling lonely, it all sucks, right? So if you take something from this episode, right? Look at Jill, she went through a process, she now found the lid to her pot, have hope that no matter where you are, and you're sitting there going, could this be me? We're both here to tell you a hundred freaking percent. It could be you. You just Absolutely. have to do something different than you're doing right now, because he's not going to walk in and deliver your pizza. Most likely, you know, I love that you say that because so many single women that I know think that they're going to be set up with Prince Charming. I happen to be one of those women that got really lucky. I went out and I dated and I really enjoyed the process and I embraced every moment of it. Um, but I, during COVID, I did get set up and I did beat my Prince Charming. Um, but that is not the norm, right? I mean, what is the, the ratio of meeting someone organically to meeting someone online? You know, there's no great data around this, unfortunately. Huh. When I first started my business 15 years ago in 2009, they were estimating that one in three marriages took place because of online dating. I think that number is vastly underestimated at this point. I mean, who doesn't know somebody that has met their partner online? Nobody at this yeah. point. I, when I do speaking events, I'm like, how many of you know somebody who's met their amazing partner online. Everybody in the audience raises their hand, right? There's no stigma attached to it anymore. Right. Yeah, there is. There used to be a stigma. Talk about that. Um, I'm sure you've had to, you know, talk a lot about people feeling embarrassed that they had to go online and they didn't want to be seen. And what if they went online and all of a sudden they swipe and they see like their neighbor, right? Like, what is that? It still happened. You really? might see your ex. I've seen my clients see their ex and get matched with their ex online. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> that's so crazy. Like delete, block. Like there's all these things. I've seen people get, have their boss come up on their screen. It's like, oh my God, how awkward, right? So, so it is what it is. The only people that are going to see you are other people that are on the apps. And if you see someone you don't want to see, just block and that person goes away and then they can't see you either. So don't be nervous about getting online. Be nervous about not having a plan and somebody to help you with it. Once you have that, you can crush online dating, but don't try to do it on your own. It can feel like somebody dropped you into the middle of the Atlantic ocean at midnight with no life vest on. You might be able to swim, but it's not going to feel very good. Talk about some of the planning that goes into place from your program and how you prepare women to be more efficient, safe, um, and really understand what red flags to look for. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, are very safety conscious and we want our clients to not only stay safe while dating, but not end up in relationships that give you paper cuts or, you know, just break your heart. So I think when you're thinking about getting out there, if you haven't online dated, number one, call me, we'll keep you safe. But if you don't, you know, do things like always meet in a place that you get yourself to. Nobody comes to your house to pick you up, not on a second date or a third date either. This person is a stranger. Just because you have one good date doesn't mean you give them your address and get in their car. You don't know this person. Always get yourself to the date. Always meet at a place that you're comfortable with. Do not go back to somebody's house after the second or the third date. I don't want anybody chopped up into a thousand pieces. You don't know this person. You feel like you know this person. You've maybe spent a cumulative four to six hours with that person. Let me put that into perspective for you ladies. That's not even Monday at work. That's good. That's a good analogy. I like that. Right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. You wouldn't, you probably wouldn't, invite someone to your house that you met on Monday at work just for the heck of it to come over alone for a bottle of wine. No, you yeah. wouldn't, right? You just, you want to keep yourself safe. Get a Google voice number, voice.google.com. It gives you a free internet-based phone number that is a fake phone number. Google your own cell phone number, ladies. See if you're Googleable by your cell phone. You'd be shocked at how many people are. Oh, I never even thought of that. Yeah. 
Yeah, you give somebody your cell phone number, they can know where you live. They can know about your divorce, right? All of a sudden it's like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Oh, you know, one of the things that I thought I was being so safe about was because on the apps, you know, you're using a text-based um, system. And so I would always make them FaceTime me so I could see and make sure they were who they were. And yeah. also it made me more comfortable going to a place and meeting someone for the first time. Um, so that was one strategy, but now you're saying not to give out your phone number. So what's another strategy so that you can make sure that the person you're texting with is actually who they say they are? Great question. COVID was terrible for every reason in the world, except that you got set up during COVID. And um, the dating apps all incorporated video into the apps now. Mm. So you don't have to give anybody your number. If you're on Match or Bumble or whatever, you can do a FaceTime within the app. Oh, it's I amazing. love that. Yes, it is. And I'll tell you what, it avoids a heck of a lot of disappointing dates because if somebody's photos were 40 pounds ago or five teeth ago, you're going to see that if you FaceTime them. Oh, that's genius. I absolutely love that. Another thing I used to do is make them give me um, a picture of their front and back of their license. And I would give it to a friend of mine. And I would say, this is who I'm going on a date with. This is where I'm going. This is what time I'm going. And I should be home around this time. It was just sort of like a security thing. Maybe it was a little overboard, but what are your thoughts on doing something like that? You know, I think that that might be, that might kind of make someone go, oh, I mean, if somebody will give you their license. Yeah, they did. That's great. Right. And I think men realize that the biggest threat in the world to women are men. Right. Yes. So yeah. I think guys are a lot more willing to accept these things, right? We want to know their last names. Heck, if somebody gives you their driver's license front and back, great. You know, if not, at least get their first and last name, do a Google search of them. Typically bad stuff comes up on page one. And again, even if you've got this guy's driver's license and his number, you get in a car with him, doesn't matter. Game right. over. Game right. over. Absolutely. So play the game safely keep yourself safe nobody needs to come over and pick you up and if a guy offers to come over and pick you up that's lovely because women we love chivalry just say thank you so much that's so kind of you i'm actually fine getting myself there but i so appreciate it right most guys will understand that if they get on you about what do you think i am some sort of a rapist why don't you want me to pick you up that is a giant red flag yeah yeah. Uh, I didn't until right now. <laughs> right, right, right. Totally. What about paying? You know, do you recommend splitting the bill, whether it's just drinks, coffee, tea, a smoothie, uh, dinner? Do you recommend that? Or do you recommend that you still allow the man to pay for you, which is super old school in my book? I mean, always offer to pay. If they say, no, let me get it, let them get it. Right. But offer. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So another stat about um, with menopause and dating um, from 2010 to 2022, there was an increase in STDs among women over the age of 55. It nearly doubled in just that span of time, which is about 10 years, right? Do you have a conversation with women on how to protect themselves. I mean, for, for sure, they're not going to get pregnant, right? So we're not worried about a pregnancy, but um, there is a rise and they're just behind young people in terms of the quantity of STDs over 55 year old women are getting. Oh yeah. I mean, you go to retirement homes in Florida where people are, you know, having sex like bunnies, right? STDs are rampant. So I actually had a great podcast episode on our podcast um, about how do you get tested? And I had a gynecologist on who talks about like, it's really going to depend on there's no such one test. You have to specify all of the things that you want tested. And, you know, depending on what parts of our body things were in and around, you might have to get tested at a variety of different places. I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? She's like, the skin can transmit STDs. Yeah. Right? yeah. So we think it has to be intercourse. <laughs> think again. Yeah. What are effective strategies for building self-confidence 
and positive self image in the dating world during this menopausal transition? Look, I think build a great team around you that's going to help you with that. Maybe it's your siblings, maybe it's your friends. Like you need people that are going to elevate you and inspire you to do this, right? Hire somebody, like I'm saying. But I think that it's so important when we talk about our own self esteem. And if you still feel like, oh my God, I just, I have no confidence. Get yourself back into therapy. We're constant works in progress, right? Therapy doesn't end at a certain point. It doesn't have to. And sometimes we go back into it. Maybe it's a group, maybe it's a post-divorce group, a support group. Like you know inside what you need. Go seek out that kind of support in order to start building your self-esteem. And I'm a big believer. I mean, people will come to me, menopausal women, like, oh my God, my belly, and I've gained 10 pounds or 20 pounds or 30 pounds, and I feel like a tube of toothpaste. Whatever it is, I promise you, look around. Is it only, you know, young size zero 20 year olds that are in relationships no people of all shapes and all sizes are holding hands with each other out in public when you go to restaurants you don't need to look any certain way and you don't need to think that you have to look like the 18 or 28 year old version of you you are beautiful as you are right now and if there's things that you want to change about yourself then Go out and seek that kind of help. Seek those kind of professionals that can help you get better at that. Yeah, this is something I often talk about with my clients um, from a health coaching perspective is building your healthcare team. And I never actually really thought of a dating coach as part of the healthcare team, but you know what? I am adding that to my list because Absolutely. we do need experts in all these different fields. We need the expert in, you know, maybe it's physical therapy at the time. Maybe it's um, a psychiatrist at the time. Maybe it's someone who specializes, specializes in um, HIIT training and strength training, right? There's, there's so many ways to build your team. It can get costly though. Um, so that could be one barrier. However, there's a lot of things people can do in terms of a lifestyle intervention that don't cost anything, right? Resetting your circadian rhythm and getting that sleep, getting that early morning sunlight, getting to bed on time, prioritizing sleep to make you feel better about yourself the next day, being more productive, um, eating healthy whole foods. I mean, you don't need to see anyone to know that just pick foods that don't come in boxes and bags. Um, but there's many things out there. What are some other things you can think of from a dating perspective? perspective, if people don't have the funds right now to hire a specific coach or academy like yourself, what, what could they do? With regards to just feeling better about themselves? Yeah. Just preparing themselves for dating. Yeah. I think put yourself in the best frame of mind that you can, right? Be hopeful, do the things that are scientifically proven beyond the shadow of a doubt to get you in a better headspace, move your body every single day, get sunlight every single day. And if this sounds hackneyed and like, oh, roll your eyes, I've heard this again. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? You can hear it. Knowledge is not power, execution is power, right? Are you doing the things? Are you helping others on a daily basis? Are you loving others? When we give, we are happier. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to get out and volunteer, but go out and volunteer, right? Maybe it's as simple as maybe you're a single mom and you're working and you don't have the time or the funds to do this. Send three people a kindness, loving meditation every single day. They will feel that vibration and you will feel like I'm sending love and peace and safety to this person through my thoughts. All of these things will make you feel better about yourself. Yeah. I love that. That's beautiful. I love that. Can you share a story about a success story about a midlife woman you've worked with before? I mean, you've worked with me or I've worked with you. I am a midlife woman. I do have a success story, but besides mine, can you share anything, um, anyone's journey that is standing out to you? Yeah, there's so many, Jill. I think, you know, I worked with a woman 
in Chicago who was just around 50 when she started working with me. Her name is Marilyn and she had been through two divorces. She married one narcissist, got divorced. The second one was first worse than the first. And she said, I am, I don't have a great job. I'm kind of entry level at a corporation. I'm a marketing assistant at this point. I've got two boys and she invested in working with us. And, you know, her entire life changed through the coaching. We were able to see so many blind spots that she had. Number one, she was gravitating towards people that were not good for her. Even through the coaching, she wanted to go towards the guys that had five red flags, but I can't help who I'm attracted to. I'm like, yes, you can. You can say no to that, right? You might want to eat chocolate cake every day, but if you're trying to get healthy, you're going to have to learn to say no. That guy is your chocolate cake or your heroin. Say no, because it's not going to make you feel good. And so we started working on her picker. She wanted to improve her style. We helped her to start to dress for the kinds of guys she wanted to date, mm. dress for the jobs that she wanted to have. She was promoted six job levels since she started working with us because she became the better and softer and kinder version of herself at work. She now is the she is responsible for global marketing at a major corporation downtown and now in her late 50s but most importantly she found the lid to her pot online and they got married during covid in a beach ceremony in key west and i was there oh i love that story i love that you also work with wardrobe right with really bringing out someone's style and i actually remember that process and do you do you still do the photo shoots we do aren't they wasn't it so fun oh my gosh everyone she has this amazing um professional uh photographer I don't know if you're still using the same one, but the man that you used before was so sweet and so kind. It made me feel so comfortable. And we've got to go to a few locations and take these amazing photos that you then have to use on your dating profile. Yeah. Um, I actually use them elsewhere too for work because they were so good. But that was one amazing exercise for me, seeing myself in these pictures dressed a certain way, just the whole vision of that and connecting with that and, and thinking, you know what, I get to create this whole next part of my journey in life. And this is part of it, how I look like my hair. Okay. Let's take that for an example. When I met you, I had straight hair. By the time I was close to my divorce, I had, was going to hot yoga. And every time I would go in with straight hair, I would come out with this hair. Right. And finally, someone said to me, did you know you had all those curls? And I said, I did kind of, except, you know, I just blow my hair dry. I've been wearing my hair straight my entire life. And they said, well, you should probably try to wear it curly someday and see how it makes you feel. And from that day forward, I've had curly hair. I love that. I think you did curly hair in our shoot. Did I? I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. I have to go look back. And, and my boyfriend that I met has the same hair as me, obviously shorter, but we have matching hair. <laughs> I love that. Beautiful curl. Yeah. Yeah. So I love the success story. There's so many amazing things to discover on this journey, working with you. And if you can't work with you, what are some other ways people can benefit from your information? Do you have things on your website? You, you mentioned yeah. a podcast, your yeah social media. Tell us all about that. Yeah. Go to our website, smartdatingacademy.com, fill out any contact form for our newsletter. And you'll be the first to know about all the things that we're doing, where I'm speaking, podcast episodes we have. Follow, um, download wherever you get your podcast, the Smart Dating Academy podcast. There's over 150 episodes with tons of amazing information, tons of inspiring love stories um, that you'll hear about. You can find the success story that I was just talking about with Marilyn. She's on our podcast. So you can search for that one um, and follow me on Instagram at smart dating Academy. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Bella. It was so fun seeing you again, catching up and talking about this topic. It's so important for midlife women to just come full circle with 
all the things that they want in their life and to em really embrace this transitional period because this is a time where although there are some changes going on, there are some really huge rewards. For one, a lot of postmenopausal women say they just don't give a shit about what people think of them anymore. They're going to recreate themselves, get that vision in play and just keep moving forward and plugging along, which I love so much. Oh, I love that. And thank you. It was such an honor to be on your show today. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks, Bella. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next episode. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Lifestyle changes can be hard and overwhelming to make. By building your support team of functional medicine doctors, therapists, and health coaches, you can reach your optimal health goals. Be sure to check out my other podcasts. Until we meet again, stay healthy.